Hello, and thanks for your time engaging in this, our Red Cross Red Crescent climate training kit. In this module, module 2B, we're going to talk about early warning, early action. What is this? Well, we are prepared to answer that question. Early warning, early action means, and you can read for yourselves, routinely taking humanitarian action before a disaster or health emergency happens, making full use of scientific information at all scales. Let's examine these words a bit more. Routinely means that we don't want this idea to happen just very occasionally. We want to change our thinking so that it is what we normally do when circumstances enable us to take action based on early warning. We want to take humanitarian action not only during and after shocks, but also before the shock, after science tells us that the shock is likely. We want to make full use of what science can tell us. If the experts notice a gigantic black cloud over there that is coming to our province, we can start taking action as soon as they see that cloud coming to us before it begins to rain like hell. We don't need to wait. We can learn what the science can say. We can learn to interpret how they say it, because sometimes it can be said in somewhat difficult words or graphs. And if we understand it, we can act before the shock, after the forecast, so that our humanitarian action is more effective and more likely to do good things. The climate is changing. We have to change. If we have more threats, if natural hazards are becoming more intense, more severe, more frequent, more bizarre, then we have to be smarter at dealing with them. We have to be prepared for more frequent work, more intense work. And this can be about floods, can be about droughts, can be about tropical cyclones, can be about heat waves, can be about coastal storms, can be about unusual diseases, can be about so many things. The traditional approach in the humanitarian sector has been dominated by response. We go through our normal lives, then a disaster happens, and during and after the shock, we run around with whatever we have, which is often very little, to try to help those who are still alive but at risk. This traditional approach took shape, took form, at a time when climate science wasn't very good. Technology wasn't available to communicate messages fast. But now, the situation is different. Now we can revise this traditional approach that is dominated by disaster response and move towards an enhanced approach that before the disaster starts with an early warning, a signal that something strange is happening, that we see unusual signals that may come our way in the form of an extreme event. This early warning, this message of watch out, alert, something dangerous may be coming your way, can become, can inform, can trigger an early action before the shock. With that early action, we can run away with time, with agility, before the disaster happens so that we're better prepared to help people get out of trouble or to be able to deal with the situation with more equipment, with more knowledge with more information, with more of everything that is needed for not only prevention, but also disaster response. Why do we want early warning, early action? Well, extreme events have implications for all sorts of sectors, health, livelihoods, shelter, water, food security. And we know that information is getting better and we can anticipate, we can prepare for these changing risks. The megaphone itself is a relatively recent invention. But now we also we have cell phones, we have the internet, we have technology to amplify and accelerate the messages of early warning and turn them into early action. There are four 
crucial elements within the package of early warning, early action. The first one is knowledge. You need to know about what can happen. Science can help, but even at the community level, we can organize the collection of information, collecting data. How high is the river? Is it safely at normal levels? Is it a little bit high? Or is it so high that any additional water coming down the river poses a threat to our community? Can we collect data to understand not only the current status of the hazard, but also the past history of risks? We need to understand what can go wrong. With that knowledge, we then monitor on a real time what is happening or what is likely to happen in collaboration with entities that know the National Meteorological Service, universities, uh, port authorities in coastal areas, many potential partners. Once we know the risk and we monitor the conditions, we need to be prepared to communicate what is known. It's very different to say, careful, a big storm seems to be coming. I think everyone can understand that message compared to the probability of precipitation exceeding 250 millimeters over the coming decade is now enhanced to between 45 and 55 percent. What is that? That is how some scientists speak of threats. But we need to be clear in how we communicate so the message is understood, so the information about hazards can inform decisions. And those decisions lead to the fourth element. The fourth element is action. To actually prepare, to do something, to act, motion with purpose, so that the information can lead to a preparedness, to anticipation, and to taking the measures that can reduce the negative consequences should the extreme event happen. Let's revisit the idea of knowledge. This slide shows a map that illustrates how vulnerable different parts of Southeast Asia are to climate change. And we can see that different districts uh, are more or less sensitive to potential shocks. This depends on uh, local conditions involving uh, services, involving access to health, involving pre-existing health conditions, poverty versus wealth, and so on. We know that some places are more vulnerable than others. We also know that the hazards that can happen in different places are different. And this is a tricky part. The monitoring of the ongoing, very dynamic conditions in the atmosphere, in the oceans, in the rivers. We need to monitor those hazards and the choices can include, for example, uh, monitoring river levels, river gauges for floods or forecasts of extreme events or, or rain gauges for uh, droughts. Uh, there can be many, many more depending on local conditions. Forecasts produced by scientists can be issued with uh, as little as hours of anticipation for things like tornadoes or electrical storms often with days anticipation, 24, 48 or more hours in terms of incoming extremes, can be temperature, can be rainfall, can be wind, sometimes even weeks. For example, for long and big river basins, if it rains upstream, it may take many days, even weeks for the water to come down. There are some uh, weather patterns, especially hot and dry conditions, that require a regional pattern that can be seen coming before it comes. There are some other things that can be seen with months in advance. You may have heard of El Nino. We will uh, offer materials to learn about El Nino in different uh, slides and different packages. But if you heard of it and if your region is sensitive to El Nino, you know with months anticipation that certain risks can be unusually high. You may have more chance of a drought in Zimbabwe, for example, or more chance of a flood in Tanzania. Again, collaboration with uh, national expert teams like meteorological services is crucial.
with three to ten days anticipation, scientists can tell which are the areas that can be in the path of a big storm. So that's good time. Three to ten days, you can take some action to anticipate, to prepare for the shock. Now, if you want to anticipate with more time, if you want to go into weeks or months, well, we cannot really tell where the typhoon is going. All we can tell is that maybe the waters are hotter than usual, and therefore there is more fuel for typhoons, and this entire part may be at risk. And the same may be true of your country. Seasonal forecasts offer more lead time, therefore more chance to take actions that take a long while to implement, but they are less specific in terms of time and in terms of location. If you think of climate change projections, well, these are about a much longer range. For the Philippines, they may say that with sea level rise, any coastal storm is likely to be more severe. So coastal communities need to prepare, need to be better equipped to deal with coastal storms. Now, climate change projections will not tell you what day and what time of day will happen a certain typhoon of a certain magnitude. We cannot see that. But it can tell you that maybe you should be better equipped at reducing the risk, how you build your home, how you have your evacuation routes and so on, and also monitor the conditions over the coming days or weeks to be more alert, because with a changing climate, the threats are changing and you need integration of knowledge at all timescales. Long lead time forecasts cannot say it all. The long term uh, forecasts are not precise. They can tell you what is more likely to happen, what is less likely to happen over a large area, not over one district. Uh, we need to monitor, as mentioned, shorter term uh, weather forecasts to anticipate when, what and how severe the manifestations of extreme events can be. Now, what of everything that is being said by scientists can be useful for humanitarian decisions? There are different ways of thinking, different levels of uh, early actions that could be taken. In the short term, there are some things we can do that need to be done in a short time and not in longer time. You don't want to evacuate a month in advance. But if you know that the storm is coming, it's sunny now, but uh, within six hours it will be very dangerous, maybe that's a good short-term decision. There are some medium-term ideas, such as the updating of contingency plans. There are other things like prepositioning of relief items or uh, enhancing the training of volunteers in search and rescue. Those are things that take a little bit of time. You don't need to do it in an hour or a day, but it's worth to do regularly, especially before uh, unusual conditions can, uh, can cause trouble. This is especially good for seasonal forecasts. And then for the long term, well, maybe we can address more uh, macro level, more big scale uh, issues. In this image, we see mangrove planting in a coastal area of Indonesia. Why? Because if the sea level is changing and if the typhoons may behave differently, planting mangroves creates a buffer in the coast that can protect the community. This cannot be done today because of tomorrow's typhoon. You need more time. In this table, uh, which is from our publication with the IFRC on early warning, early action, you can see an example of different actions that are appropriate at different timescales. I invite you to read it. It's rich in the texture of this example, how much can be done. For example, in the lowest row, when we speak about hours, if the example of early warning is very heavy rainfall, almost surely leading to flood, well, what kind of early action can we take? as mentioned, evacuate. Now, if it's about days, the forecast saying that heavy rainfalls days in advance may result in flash floods, what kind of actions can you take? Well, you can prepare for evacuation. Don't evacuate yet, but get things ready. Mobilize your volunteers, get the warnings and instructions out to communities so people know what to do should the 
uh, request to evacuate arrive. If you have a seasonal forecast, speaking of weeks or even months, speaking of unusual risk of certain uh, flood, uh, extreme rainfall coming through the season, you can alert volunteers of communities that the conditions are uh, strange, work with other uh, organizations to prepare, to enable better coordination, you can inform communities, you can replenish uh, the stocks of relief items, uh, rethink what to do, revisit plans, and so on. Now, if you have years in advance, if the climate change projections say that the risk of flooding is increasing because of changing atmospheric conditions and so on, what can you do? Well, you can anticipate that this will need revision, that all the flood contingency plans, for example, may need to be adjusted, not only because of climate, but also because of changing social issues like population uh, settlements and so on. You can identify how different vulnerable groups are changing. Do we have uh, more people with HIV AIDS living in the region? Do we have more elderly people? Do we have uh, unusual clusters of people who speak a different language, for example, and so they wouldn't understand the, the early warning issued by radio. What can we start doing now to anticipate long-term impacts that we can see from now? I really like this slide. The road ahead. If you only monitor the long term, you may miss a pothole and you may get into trouble and be derailed. But if you're only looking very short term, you may miss the important things happening ahead of you down the road. So we need to pay attention to critical information in the immediate, in the medium and in the long term. As mentioned, it's important to work with others who can understand the signals of the weather and the climate. These are usually experts. They can be atmospheric scientists. They can be hydrologists. They can be uh, public health experts. Understandably, when they speak, they speak in a language that is technically precise, that is analytically rigorous. Sometimes it can be confusing. So to understand each other, for you to understand what they say about the hazard and the risk, or for them to understand what your actions can be, what uh, choices you have, what risks matter. It's important to have a dialogue. It's important to communicate. In this slide, you can see an example of an expert speaking to a graph that doesn't really communicate much in words that are incomprehensible. And the people from the Red Cross Red Crescent are like, oh my God, what is going on? It is, it can be difficult to understand, but continued dialogue can help. One of the ideal ways of working with experts is to define triggers for action. Levels of risk that we think, ah, if it rains less than this much, no problem. If the expert says it's going to rain three drops tomorrow, ah, I don't think we need to do much about it. But if they say that it's going to rain 300 millimeters or that it is likely to rain between 100 and 300 millimeters, well, we need to understand better what that means because maybe we can look at the past and notice that if it rains more like, for example, 150 millimeters, that may be a threshold that really means danger. So if we could establish triggers for action, especially for actions that are low cost, that can be done with little money or little resources, or maybe choices that are no regrets, that if you do it and the disaster doesn't materialize, it's not such a big deal. Some of these things training people, for example. It's not that bad if you train people and it doesn't uh, uh, occur a gigantic flood in a week. The training is still useful. Sometimes the action can be beneficial even without a disaster. For example, uh, vaccinations. It can be good to be prepared. It's not easy to do this, but it's worth trying. To establish triggers, you want to draw on the past understanding and knowledge of disasters, establish and document which is the threshold of risk that should trigger action 
well before the forecast arrives. You don't want to start doing that calculation when it's imminent that the disaster will happen or is likely to happen. You need to ensure there is internal support within your organization. This takes time. You need to work with partners, uh, often with government, uh, which, depending on the country, can have the unique authority to trigger certain actions. Whenever you have choices, it's better to focus on these actions that will be low cost as opposed to very expensive. No regrets as opposed to, oh my gosh, how could I do that? And then it didn't uh, happen. And solutions that are beneficial. However, sometimes you may need to do things that are none of the above. If there is a 95% chance of a gigantic typhoon killing the entire population, maybe we should take action, even if there is a 5% chance that you act in vain, that it seems wasteful to have acted. But you know what? Getting it wrong 1 in 20, I think is acceptable. If by getting it right 19 out of 20 times, you really save lives, you really prevent losses. To take action to establish these triggers, you need to tailor the action to the hazard and its uh, chance of occurring. You don't want to make a massive move for a small threat. You don't want to make a little move for a gigantic threat. You need to understand and accept that if you take action, maybe some people will think that it wasn't worth it. Because with climate science and with weather forecasts, you cannot know for sure that something will happen. You can only know that something is much more likely to happen. The core for you will be to examine the trade-offs. What if I act and the disaster doesn't happen? What if I act in vain? What if I don't act if the, and the disaster happens? What if I fail to act? The consequences of those two and the costs of action and inaction should shape your analysis. We are working with others to think about innovative ways to finance the forecast-based actions, to give resources to act based on the forecast and make that available well in advance of the warning. So for example, in this uh, slide, you see if the expert speaks, you have an analysis, you look at the map, what can be at risk, you have an existing pot of money that can trigger that early action. Our current projects with the German Red Cross in Uganda, in Togo, are very promising. Having the resources can enable people to feel comfortable taking action because that's financing that is pre-assigned to early action based on early warning. In terms of communication, the early warning messages must contain six basic elements. One is the timing. When do we think that the natural hazard may come and hit? When is the hazard due to strike? The second one is location. Where can things go wrong? Is it the entire country or just one province or just the western region? The scale. How, how serious is this hazard likely to be? Are we talking of a hurricane category 5? Or is it just a tropical storm, not even a hurricane? How high is the water level likely to get? Some are completely catastrophic. Some are very bad. Some are sufficiently damaging that action may be worth it. In terms of impact, what can go wrong if the hazard happens? It's very different to have extreme rain in a densely populated area versus in the middle of the desert. Importantly, what are the chances? What is the probability? of this extreme event happening. 5% chance, should we act, should we not act, compared to 80% chance, where still maybe it doesn't happen, but it's really, really likely to happen. And of course, the actions. If there's nothing you can do about the hazard, well, the forecast isn't very useful. But if there are different actions you can take, what can people at risk do to protect themselves, what can we as humanitarian workers do to help others? Often in terms of how we consider our communication, we need to think of forecasts in the following way. Sometimes it looks like some uh, strange person is talking and is talking about things that are very colorful and complicated but don't make much sense. If that's what's happening, we need to clarify what exactly is going on. 
forecasts are largely based on observing the past. If in the past, before a flood, it has rained upstream, we look at the rainfall upstream and if we see it raining very intensely, we can anticipate a flood coming. That's what scientists do. They just use more sophisticated instruments and language and maps and depictions. We can try to understand that. It is crucial uh, that communities themselves are actively involved at every stage, from knowledge to monitoring, all the way to action. How can communities be engaged in uh, risk knowledge, in monitoring hazards, in communicating the warnings, in taking early action? Well, that of course changes from one place to the other, uh, but we can share with you some examples. Uh, the first uh, example on how to put this all together comes from Tuvalu and Kiribati, two very small uh, island nations in the Pacific region. They are small countries, but with big hearts. And uh, when the National Red Cross Societies received a warning in 2010 about a La Nina phenomenon, which implied unusual risk of dry conditions, they were expecting high chance of normally, so, uh, sorry, high chance of drier than usual conditions. What could they do? Well, they could say, you know what, if it gets dry, what, what can go wrong? And what can we do about it? So they established partnerships with key stakeholders. Uh, they launched public awareness campaigns. And they initiated, for example, wise uh, water use. Don't use all the water in the tank. Be more efficient in how you wash your hands, how you cook, how you shower, and many other things. Campaigns about cholera prevention. Campaigns about hand washing. Because when there's water scarcity, certain diseases are more likely. Another example from Bangladesh in the year 2007, they received an early warning of a big cyclone, uh, cyclone sitter, uh, approaching their coast. Decades ago, uh, one cyclone killed almost half a million people. And now cyclones of similar strength approaching more densely populated areas, they don't kill as much because there's an early warning system in place that triggers early action. The number of people who died was still very high, but was much less than would have been the case without this system. Um, and this is mostly local residents being alerted through a megaphone, a message that travels faster than the natural hazard. We can be faster and smarter. Uh, there's another example from West Africa in 2008. We have very good documentation. There was a seasonal forecast saying that uh, rainfall was likely to be more extreme than usual. In the previous year, in 2008, there was a lot of flood and it led to uh, trouble and uh, flood operations were slow to be triggered. Help arrived like 40 days late. But now with the early warning, the team of the IFRC in West and Central Africa thought of what could be done and they thought about prepositioning relief items training volunteers, uh, even getting visas for the disaster response teams to be able to cross fast and accelerate the action. And this led to very, very good work. Even working in one of the rivers where there's a dam upstream that can cause flooding downstream to have a plan for both countries to coordinate. So if the dam has to open the floodwaters, people downstream are prepared. The resources were used much more efficiently, 33% less money spent per beneficiary in 2008, thanks to this uh, early warning, early action approach, compared to the previous years when disasters also happened. Uh, these low cost actions uh, can be beneficial, even if the flood don't materialize. You can update contingency plans, you can train the trainers, you can increase awareness, increase capacity. You can do the paperwork for crossing border of trucks or of people, uh, health insurance, uh, relief items. If you preposition them now and you don't need them now, but maybe you need them next year, it's not that bad. Uh, shorter term early warning systems can be put in place now and they will be useful when the next disaster happens. Useful is also to set up relationships with the experts, meteorological agency, hydrological agencies, dam operators, and so on. Uh, government authorities, of course, uh, are always a good partner to have 
to allow for early actions to happen within the broader system of disaster risk management. Now, it's unfortunate that this approach of early linking early warning with early action is not being implemented as much as widely as systematically as it could. Uh, for example, in the year 2010-2011, there were these signals of La Nina, an unusual cooling of the waters in the Pacific that can tell us with a few months in anticipation that things are likely to change in negative ways. This is a map of the seasonal rainfall forecast that was issued in October 2010. You can see a lot of areas showing blue, meaning oh, looks like more risk of floods or extreme rains and a lot of parts showing um, yellowish colors, which means a confidence of different levels from low to high that the risk of dry conditions is enhanced. This was issued in October for the coming three months, November 2010 to January 2011. And this is showing which areas did actually experience flooding or drought during that period. You can tell a majority of the places that had flood or drought, the scientists could see it coming as very likely. We didn't take early action in all those regions. Sometimes it's difficult, sometimes we need time, sometimes we need resources. But generally speaking, if we are better prepared to receive the information and act upon it, we're likely to do a better humanitarian job. If you want more uh, information about uh, this approach, one good place to start is to become familiar with the IFRC map room. This was done in collaboration between IFRC, the Climate Center, and our dear colleagues at IRI, uh, a climate and society team uh, at Columbia University. And there is a website that shows forecasts for the coming three days, uh, sorry, for the coming six days, for the coming seasons. There's different choices in that website and there are uh, also teams that can help you understand how to use it. There's even a help desk uh, that you can send an email to to ask any questions and your email will be answered pretty much consistently within 24 hours. In conclusion, forecasts can help you across timescales from the imminent to the very likely medium term to the long term climate projections to anticipate and better prepare for extreme events for disasters, for health emergencies. It's not only about uh, preventing the loss of life. It's also about improving response time. It's about uh, resource efficiency. It's about doing better with what we have. We have more knowledge. Can we take more and better and smarter action? We can do so by uh, building a good relationship with those who produce the information about the likely threats. We can establish better and more reliable chains of communication. We can have clear messages and we can develop ideas on what actions to take based on the forecast before the forecast happens so that we don't spend time thinking of action. We already know what action to take next time the forecast comes. So we are going to be experiencing disasters in the future. Before the disaster, there will pretty much certainly be a forecast coming from scientists saying that something strange is likely to happen. We can make decisions based on those forecasts to address, to reduce uh, climate risks. If we consider the forecasts across timescales, the Red Cross and Red Crescent can first build community resilience, importantly create action plans for predictable hazards, floods, droughts, severe storms, fires, and much more. And we can be effective, not only during and after the emergency, but importantly, before the emergency. If you have any questions, uh, there is a partnership, uh, as mentioned earlier, with experts. Here's an email address, ifrc at iri.columbia.edu. Uh, our colleagues can help understand climate change trends and projections can help interpret seasonal forecasts and also short-term forecasts. They can provide uh, recommendations of which national or regional experts to reach to for more uh, locally relevant information. And they can help you understand whether what you're noticing maybe can be attributed 
to climate change or to natural climate variability. Final slide. Early warning is a chain of people linked to a chain of actions. We can make it work. We will make it work with your help. Thanks so much for joining us and we wish you all the best with your work.